Heavenly Father, King of glory, our Lord and our God, Lord, we thank you once again for this privilege to study at your feet. Mighty God, we pray that you will teach us tonight in the name of Jesus. Lord, I hand over myself to you, O God. I am nothing but an empty vessel, Lord. I pray that you will possess me, O God, even at this hour, that you will speak through me to bless us all in the name of Jesus. Lord, I come against every power that is not of you, every gathering of the kingdom of darkness, that would have gathered, O God, even against this meeting tonight, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke them. In the name of Jesus, I bind them hands of feet and I cast them into the bottomless pit in the name of Jesus. Everlasting King of glory, take control, take dominion. Let your name be glorified tonight. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated in his presence. You're welcome to Bible Studies. And uh, uh, today's um, topic is uh, titled, The Love for the Father. The topic for today's Bible studies is the love for the Father. The love for the Father. And our lesson text is taken from the book of John, chapter 14, verses 21 to 24, and then verses 30 and 31. John 14. 20, 21 to 24, and then verses 30 and 31. Let us read our lesson text. The book of John, chapter 14, verses 21 to 24 says, He who has my commandment and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Verse 24. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Um, I know if I ask us here, how many of us do love the Lord? I mean, I by, indicate by show of raise of hands. I'm pretty sure that everyone will raise their hands in this place. We do love God, and we do claim that. And um, But what I want us to do is, through this lesson, to examine your love for God, so that you can be able to see, at the end of this lesson, how much you are truly loving Him. Lesson introduction. The first and great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Jesus said that on this great commandment and the second, which is to love your neighbor as yourself, hangs the law and the prophets. We can find that in Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 to 34. We will not read, but you can write it down. Matthew 22 verses 36 to 34. Without the agape love, so 36 to 40, sorry, have mercy on me. Thank you for paying attention. So 36 to 40, have mercy. Matthew 22, 36 to 40, before the cup my eyes. Without the agape love, all other understanding of love is non existent or at best superficial or subjective. Without the agape love, all other forms of love doesn't exist. Or at best, they are superficial or subjective. You can make it whatever you want. I'm going to come back to that even in the course of this lesson to explain that a little bit further. But let's continue with our introduction. In order to love God in the capacity He demands, one would need a good biblical understanding of love 
and how God expects us to love him. Many Christians have defined love as giving, charity. However, or the likes of it. However, a closer look at the word love biblically shows us that love is not charity or giving, but rather an attribute of love. So giving by itself, it's not love. It's just an attribute of love. Let's see 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse, law, verse, verse 3, sorry, 13, 3. And it says, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So now, giving, we're talking about giving here to the extreme. That they're giving all that you have and nothing was left. Even go extra mile and even give your own self to be killed for others. And you have not love. He says it profits you nothing. Now I will explain this a little bit so that it wouldn't be that you know, difficult to grasp as we go down in this lesson. Say for instance, um, let me use an irony. Cliff is meek. And Cliff is meek. Now, meekness by itself is not Cliff. Meekness will exist outside Cliff. Somebody else could be meek. So when you see meekness, we are not seeing Cliff. But Cliff has the attribute of being meek. So Cliff is something else and not meekness. But you can see meekness as part of my character. So in some way, God or give, um, giving is part of, is an attribute of love, but by itself, it's not love. So that's why the Bible says, that though I give even to the extreme, to my, all my goods, and even to my body, and to myself, and have not love. So you see, giving exists by itself, and love is something absolutely different from giving. And if I do that and I have not love, the Bible says it profits me nothing. So, in the course of this lesson, let us look at our lesson objective. Our lesson objective is, you know, is to gain a profound understanding of the word, or, or sorry, a profound understanding of love from God's own perspective, so as to adequately love the Father. Our lesson objective is to gain a profound understanding of the word love from God's perspective, so as to adequately love the Father. Remember our topic, the love for the Father, the love that we have for the Father. And then, I will come back to that um, statement I made earlier on, that without the agape love, all other understanding of love are non-existent, or at best superficial, or subjective. So, now, the Greeks, God has blessed them with a lot of philosophical wisdom. So they came up with a lot of ideas and so many things that we could not, they, they see things beyond the way the other people, other nations see it. So they were able to dissect love and break it down into different levels or into different categories of love. And they said there is an agape love, which is the love that God has for the world, for God's so love. The love that loves for the person for the sake of the person being loved the love that has nothing to gain in return the love that is only bestowed by god and the god kind of love to love without expecting without any benefit at all but to love for the sake of the person being loved and they call that agape love and they say there is one they call storge which is the protective love the love we have for our children and they say there is another love called you know, um, Eros, the romantic love, the one we have for our spouses. And they say there is another one called Philo, Philos, which is the love, brotherly love, the one we have for brotherly love, one another. So, but the thing is this, that these things are not a kind of love by itself, if you understand what love it is, but it's rather an offshoot of love or a branch of love. For instance, I will explain it in this way, that the agape love is the stem, is the vine, is the love itself, and all this love protrudes from this 
agape love. So in other words, if I have agape love and I extend it to my wife, it will produce the eros kind of love. If I have an agape love and I, produce, I extend it to my son, to my children, it will produce the story kind of love. And if I produce, extend that same love to my friends, it will produce the philos, the Philadelphia, the one you have talking about Philadelphia and stuff like that, talking about the brotherly love. But now, if you take away the agape love, all other laws will be whatever you define it to be. It will have no meaning. It will be whatsoever I tell me to be. I will give us an example. There was a story I learned of some time ago of a woman who so much loved her children and she was going through her times. And because she was going through terrible times, because of the love she has for her children, she decided to put them in the car and drown them in the river so that they wouldn't suffer with her. You see her definition of love. So when you remove the agape love, you see that love has no meaning. It becomes whatever anyone defines it to be. So the only thing that makes any love at all to make sense is the love for the Father, is the love of God. So that is the only thing that, the only love that stands, the agape love, the love for the Father, and the love for, or the love for the Father, and the love of the Father, or the love of God kind of love. And that is where we want to dwell here to understand what love is, because love does not have any other meaning or interpretation except for what God calls it to be. Any other thing we give it outside the body of God, outside the understanding of the knowledge of God could mean anything to different people at any time, or at best, it means nothing. So, understanding and definition of love. You see, the understanding of love to mean giving is usually built on the premise for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John 3.16. Who not Who not read? John 3.16. So the understanding of love being given is usually built on this premise. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So, but in that giving, see, love there, or God so loved for, in the, the giving in the, God so loved the world is only an attribute of love amidst other attributes that you can find about love in 1 Corinthians 13 verses 7 to 4 to 7. 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 to 7. You see, if we read, let's go to 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 to 7. So let's just, you know, freshen up our minds a little bit and we, so we can be able to flow along. So it says, love suffers long and is kind. So it's saying what love does. Love suffers long and is kind. What love does? That is not love, but what love does? He says, love does not envy, love does not parade itself. What love does not do? Those things are not love. What love does not do? And then we will later come to what the love does. He said, it is not puffed up. That means love is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own. It is not provoked, think no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things and hopes all things and endures all things these are the characteristics of love what you can expect love to display but by itself all these things put together does not define love does not mean love love stands out separately and also amidst all these attributes we have read if we also go to hebrews 12 let us read hebrews 12 6 to 7 Hebrews 12, 6 to 7. Sorry. Hebrews 12, 6 to 7. It says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Now, when you also look at Revelation before I expand on this a little bit, Revelation chapter 3 verse 19, Revelation 3 19, it says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. So, amidst all these attributes of love we read in 1 Corinthians 13 4 to 7, are also those we have read in Hebrews 12 6 to 7 and um, Revelation 3.19 which is chastisement, chastening which is to put someone under suffering for the purpose 
to build moral character. That is what chastisement is. That's what chastening is. To put someone under suffering in order to build what moral character in that person. So God is saying that he also do chastening. That means who he loves, that his love also produces chastening. So you see that we can also claim that love is chastening. But we can see that by chastening by itself is not love, but just an attribute of what love can produce. So that's why we chasten our children, that's why we discipline our children when they are doing wrong because we love them. But the discipline by itself is not love. Now, going forward in understanding what is love, the, the scriptures that we have read, you know, display love as, you know, uh, displays um, so many characters of love. Now, the Bible expressly tells us that God is love. In other words, love is God. We know that in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 and verse 16, 1 John 4, 8 and 16. 4 John 4 says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Go 16, he says, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God. And God in him. So, the Bible clearly and expressly tells us what love is. He said, love is God. And in other words, God is love, period. The Bible didn't say anything beyond that. Then Jesus went further to tell us plainly that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John chapter 14, verse 15. said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Remember in our lesson introduction, I said that for us to be able to love God in the capacity he demands of us, which is to love him with all our hearts, soul, and mind, we need to gain a profound understanding of what love means from the biblical perspective of it and what God expects or demands of us in regards to loving him so that to appropriately or adequately love God. So now, here, Jesus is telling us what God demands of us of love. We've learned that love is God. Now, Jesus is telling us what God actually demands of us when it comes to love. How he wants to be loved. How he can, we can love him. And he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Therefore, we could unequivocally interpret 1 John 4, 8 as, He who does not keep the commandments, who does not keep God's commandments, does not love and does not know love for God is love. So he who does not keep God's commandments does not love and does not know the love of God. Now I will bring us back to the example of the story I gave before of the woman who loves God. If she keeps God's commandments, she wouldn't have drowned her children. And because she does not keep God's commandments, her love invariably is nothing, makes no sense because the commandments of God would have taught her not to kill her children. Even as simple as thou shalt not murder. So, whenever you remove the obedience to God's commandment, love is inexistent in that place. And that's what Jesus was saying, that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So, knowing this about love, knowing having all these attributes, putting all these things together, we've learned how God wants us to love, knowing that God is love, and how God wants us to love him, we can define love as the selfless acts we do to bring or to fulfill God's will in the, love, in the world. So love is the selfless acts we do to fulfill God's will in the world. Remember, God is love. Love is all about God and without God there is no love and that is why you can give all you have and yet not have love. So love becomes the selfless act we do to see God's will fulfilled in our life. And that is why God chastened the son that he loves so that he can be able to fulfill his will in his life. And that is why you chasten your son or your children so they can be able to see God's will fulfilled in their life. And now let's come back to that John 3.16 
where we normally draw the premise that love is given. John 3.16 said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. What is that? God wants to fulfill his will in the world. As a result of that, he gave his Son to accomplish his will for humanity, that humanity will be saved, which had been his heart desire even from the day that man fell in the Garden of Eden. So that is the purpose. That was why he gave his son that he will fulfill his will in this world. That he will accomplish his goal in this world. So when we obey the commandments of God, it is geared towards achieving or fulfilling the will of God in one's life. And also, so when um, we don't do the commandments of God, I mean God's will is not being fulfilled in someone's life. And that means love will not exist in that place. Now if we go back to our text to better understand loving the Father. Let us see our text. Go back to John chapter 14. We read verse 21. John 14 verse 21. It says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is him, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. It is he who loves who has my commandments and keep them. That is the person who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by who? By my father, and we will manifest, I will manifest myself to him. So we see that Jesus said a new commandment also I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you see the question is sometimes we ask why did Jesus give us the commandment to love one another instead of to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul why did he say when he was giving them a new commandment he said love one another he said that's a new commandment that I give you instead of that now this is because you cannot love one another without loving the Father. That is, keeping his commandments. Like I said earlier, check out agape and every other kind of love or understanding of love becomes non-existence or subjective meaning. Now if we go to John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 and 21. It says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who, so for her, for he who does not love his brother, who he sees, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love, must love his brother also. So, it is, let me put it this way, it's automatic. It's impossible to love God and hate your brother. So why Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another, it is, that is what you will use to test and know your love for God. Because many a time, like I said earlier on, we all claim we love God. So that is the only litmus test for you to be able to examine and see whether you are truly loving God as you ought to love God. How much you love your brother. Because it is practically impossible. If loving God is keeping the commandments of God, it's practically impossible for you to hate your brother when God commanded you to love your brother and you say you love God. So when you obey the commandment of God, you don't have to struggle to love your brother. So Jesus knows that there is no way you can jump the queue to love your brother except you have loved God. And if you claim to love God and you have not loved your brother, invariably the love for the Father is not in you. And that's why he gave us that to be able to check ourselves, to examine ourselves, to see how we are loving the Father, which is the great commandment that he has given us. That we should love the Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our soul, and with all our mind. If we also see Matthew 26 verse 39. Matthew 26 verse 39. And he says, 
he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed. Sorry. Yes. And prayed. Okay. Um, and prayed. If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. I'm going to come down. I think I was a little bit faster to bring this um, scripture. We're going to come back to that later. So, but why did Jesus commanded us to love one another as he had loved us in John 15, 12. Now, the commandment was not just to love one another, but the standard was as he has loved us. We see that in John chapter 15, verse 12. Now, the question will be, how did Jesus love us? How did he love us? Many you know, times we say he loved us so much that he gave himself to die on the cross. Are you going to give yourself to die on the cross for your brother? I will answer for you. The answer is no. I know you won't do that. I know no, no one here will give his life for me. So, we are not going to do that. So, how did Jesus love us, love us then? Let us see our main text. Go back to our main text. John 14. And then let's read verses 30 and 31. So now, you know, Jesus telling them about love, how they can love the Father, explaining to them what love is and what God expects of them for love, or for loving Him. Then at the end, He says in verse 30 and 31, He says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and He has nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let's go. Have you seen how Jesus loved us? He loved us through absolute obedience to the Father's commandments. He said, so that the world will know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me commandments, so I do. So, in obeying the Father's commandment, invariably the love of God is shed upon us through his absolute obedience to God's command. And that is exactly what God has asked us to do ourselves. That in obeying his commandment absolutely, invariably, love God's love will be shared to other people who are around us. So Jesus loved us through an absolute obedience to the commandment of God. And that's what that brings us to that scripture that I, I quoted earlier on Matthew 26, verse 39, when he said, you know, that Father, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. So he obeyed the Father completely, even unto death. And that is why we have salvation today. If he had disobeyed, if he had disregarded that, your John 3.16 will have no meaning. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We will not be experiencing that love today. But through his absolute obedience to the word of the Father, we receive love from God. And that is what God expects from each and every one of us. And that's why Jesus tells us expressly that if you love me, keep my commandment. And if we go down to verse um, verse 24 of that, he reiterates that by saying, he who does not love me does not keep my word. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So, invariably, if you're not keeping God's commandment at any level, the love of the Father is not in you. You do not love God. You can claim it all you want. You can sing it all you want. You can dance it all you want. But when you stand before God, you'll be found one thing in the aspect of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So the love of God is in absolute obedience to his commandments. And that is how Jesus has loved us. And that's why we are partakers of his love today. So knowing this, therefore, you cannot claim to love the Father without an absolute obedience to his commandment to go and preach the gospel. Matthew 28 verses 19 to 20, we will not wait. Matthew 28 verses 19 to 20. You cannot lay claim of the love of the Father when you don't daily or regularly engage in taking the gospel to the world, to everyone that comes around you, because it's his commandment that we should go and do. So, the love for the Father is in obedience to his word. When you simply obey that commandment, you are showing love 
to the world who are not saved. You are showing compassion. They are sinning. They are witnessing the love of God even through you. And <clears throat> excuse me. And sometimes this little act of love that we do by simple obedience, you don't know what it will yield in the future. Now I always tell people, don't worry about saving them. You are not Jesus. Your commandment ends at go and preach the gospel. Period. You preach the gospel. You tell the person about Christ and leave the rest to God. So most times we feel we have failed because the person did not yield to God. Or because the person did not accept and all set. Or because the person did not respond positively. That does not define failure. With obedience to the word of God that, that shows the love for the Father. As long as you have done what God has asked you to do, you are all set. I will tell you, um, I think, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but last month in December, a young man walked into my, you know, two young men walked into my store to pick up money from MoneyGram. And as I was processing the thing, I heard the younger one, the smaller one, telling the other guy that, you know, everybody write their story. He is writing his story. He is writing his story. Everybody is writing their story. Everybody is writing their story. And it means like we connect that there are some philosophical, you know, things going on within this and this. He's trying to convert this guy or well, I wonder what he's saying, but I know something has to do with, you know, trying to work on the other guy's mind. And I was like, as I was about to bring the money and I asked him, I just like, God gave me wisdom to ask me, look as if you were a philosopher. He said, no, I'm not a philosopher. I am a satanist. These are young people maybe about early 20s, late 20s, no, no mid-20s. He said, no, I am not a, I'm not a philosopher, I am a satanist. He said, wow. He said, what does it take to be a satanist? He said, I believe in hell. And that someday hell will open up and we will fight against God and we will defeat God. This is in my store. I'm telling you life. No, no, I'm not adding words to this. Rather, maybe I'm not saying it enough. His eyes were becoming red and furious. And I can see the power of sin over his life. And I, I'm like, God, how do I address this issue? The other guy was just looking at me and I was, I said, okay. So you believe in hell. I said, wow, wonderful. So you believe, he said, I believe in Amagadon. We will fight against God and I believe that we win. I said, okay. He said, wow. I said, before I could talk, he said, no, I have the right to believe whatever I want to believe in. And you, I said, yes, of course, you do. Everybody has the right to believe whatever they want to believe in. But please, I just want to give you one, so just one thing for you. You see, I would have just chucked, uh, I know why I, I, I raised up this, but most times we are afraid to talk, to say the gospel, to say something to someone about God, waiting till you save the person. I wasn't even going to preach, because I saw the way this one is going, there is no need to preach anything to this one. Don't even go there, but I just saw a seed of the word. I told him, that I just want to just drop a word for you. I don't know you. Believe whatever you believe is okay. That's no problem. That's, 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 our, that's our human rights. I said, there's something the Bible says. He said, I used to be a Christian before I even mentioned the Bible. I said, oh, wow, wonderful. Then you must be familiar with this. That God said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I said, if you truly know what hell is about and what hell is like, you will want to have nothing to do with hell. But at the same time, just do me a favor, please. Just then, by that time, he was already at the door with, the, with his uh, person he's trying to convert. He said, please, do me one favor. I said, go research hell. Google it. Anyhow, you can research it. Research it anywhere, anyhow. Just your own personal judgment. So I, I said, why is this? So that when you're believing in hell, I want you to believe it based on knowledge. So you don't believe out of ignorance. You don't believe because people are saying things are wonderful. And I'm not asking you to believe God or believe anything out of that way. Know what you believe in. Go and research hell. He, then at that time I was saying that he was calm. Then he left. Today, you know, as God we have it, the same young man who he was trying to convert that day came to my store to pick up money. And I recognized him and I asked him, what of your friend? He said, what friend? I said, the one that, you know, was talking about uh, his beliefs here the other day. He said, oh, oh, he said, that guy, he's a crazy guy. He said, even he called me now, he said, he said, he has found a new life. He has found Jesus. 
You see, maybe it's not what I said, go and research her. I said, thank God. He said, he's sorry to her. I said, no, 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 you don't have to be sorry. I said, I'm grateful he came here. See, you hear what he said, he has found a new life. He has found Jesus. I said, maybe that's why God brought him here. I said, how about you? You have not found anything yet. He was looking at me. Then I, I pushed him. He then started telling me story. His parents used to be a Christian. His parents is a Christian. His mother used to tell me about God. I just talked to him. I just preached to him. You know, I even invited the Bible study today. But he said he can't make it today. So, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say is this. Obey God's commandments and leave the rest to God. So, I will come down again. Say, when you only greet those who, who greet you and hate those who hate you, and do not pray for those who hate you and maybe sometimes you even curse those who curse you and those who spitefully use you do not pray for them you do not love them he said the love of the father is not in you you cannot lay hold of the love of god you cannot claim to love god if you cannot sit down or kneel down and pray for the person that hurt you so bad act of a good and not the one who kill die destroy kill god vengeance i'm not talking about that I'm not going about to pray for their salvation, to pray for the love of God over their lives. I'll tell you an example to portray this. Even if it's one of these two, we stop. It's okay, fine. See my time. One day, I was at work, and someone sent me a video where people are being slaughtered by this Boko Haram in Nigeria. I don't like to watch those videos, but this one sent me on WhatsApp. I just looked at it and I saw it. My heart caught. In where people will innocently walk to the grave that they have dealt, you know, um, what's the name, uh, the mass grave, lay down on their own, just like sheep being slaughtered, they will take knife, cut off their head, push them into the grave, the next person will come, lay down, and I was, oh my goodness, the sight was horrible. And I rose and I wanted to pray. God just let me pray. Well, I wanted to pray, God destroy this. God, you know, God said, what? He said, when they were stoning Stephen, how many people did he say they should kill? He said, when he was hanging on the cross, how many of his killers did he condemn? He said, if he has killed Paul, we will be talking about Paul today. My prayer changed. God, save these people. God, show these people your light. God is the devil. God, you know, see, when God deals with you, you understand what the law of the Father is. You know why sometimes I, I caution people when you see some of these videos that they said, in the book of Mark, they pray, fire, kill, kill. I said, you don't know the God you're serving. You don't know the God you're talking about. We pray to show the world the love of God. It's in that that the love of the Father is seen in us. By absolute obedience to the word of God, whether it makes sense or it does not make sense. Most times, it does not make sense. I tell you the truth. Most times, I tell you, God, why? But... We have to obey what he said we should do. Another point is that you cannot claim to love the Father when you cannot forgive those who offend you. The love of the Father is not in you. You don't love God. If you cannot from your heart forgive those who offend you. Your love, singing, dancing, I love you, Lord, I love you, is in vain. When you stand before God, you will know that the love of the Father is not in you. In Leviticus chapter 19, we will read, uh, I will read that and I will give you other scriptures. Take that. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17 to 18. Leviticus 19, 17 to 18. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. Let's hold on that in verse 17. Say, you shall surely rebuke your brother and not be a sin because of him. I always tell people, don't partake in another person's sin. I try to put it in to work myself. He's helping me. Most times we sin because other people sin against us. And that's what God is telling us. Why do you want to be a sin because of your brother who has sinned against you? Now you want to hold on forgiveness. You want to hold malice. You're not bearing sin. You want to hold hatred. He said, you shall not take vengeance nor bear grudges or bear any grudge against the children of your people. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. See where that comes? You have to obey God completely. You shall not be any grudges. Many times we say we don't take vengeance, I'm going to stop here. I say we say we don't take vengeance of God. We think that vengeance is only when someone does wrong for you and you came and 
smack him back or smack you, smack him back. But when someone does something to you and you are in a position to do something good for that person and you withhold it because of what he has done, that is vengeance. When someone has hurt you and you are in a position to pray for that person and you do not pray for that person, you are taking vengeance. When someone who is your enemy is doing you evil and you are in a position to give them food when they are hungry or feed them and you do not do it so, you are taking vengeance. Vengeance is not yours. And let us take these scriptures down um, in portray, to portray more what I said. Um, Mark 11, 25 to 26. And Colossians, Mark 11, 25 to 26. Where Jesus said, when you stand praying, you should forgive anyone who has hurt you. Because if you do not do so, your father will not forgive you. That's an express command to forgive. Colossians 3, 12 to 14. Colossians 3, 12 to 14. Also tells us, about forgiving those who has hurt us. So, I'm going to stop at this note because of time. Now, like I said earlier on with the little we've heard, one thing we've been able to establish is that God is love. And that the way and the manner God expects us to love him is through absolute obedience to God's commandments. And the manner in which Jesus has loved us as which he commanded us to love him is the same way he has loved us through absolute obedience to his father's word, which we saw and read in Matthew 14, verses 30 to 31. So, having this understanding about love, we're able to come to a conclusion or believe, understanding that love are those very acts we do to fulfill God's will in the world, whether it's in your brother's life, or in your life, or in anybody's life. Love's purpose is to fulfill God's will in the world. And that's why God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. May God bless us, even as we continue to obey God's commandment in totality, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We're going to pray before we go into our contributions. I just want you to pray. First of all, two prayer points you just want to take. One, ask God for forgiveness. Like I said, as I was teaching, I said, as with this lesson, go and examine your heart and see if your claim of the love of the Father will stand up the test of God's own judgment. Examine your heart. And in every way you can tell, the Holy Spirit will convict you that you have not loved the Father enough. Ask Him for forgiveness even tonight. Mighty God, King of glory. Lord and our God, Lord, I pray thee for mercy. Lord, I pray thee for forgiveness, O God. In every way I have failed to show your love to the world. In every way I have failed to obey you completely in all things, my Father. Lord, let your mercy prevail over my life in the name of Jesus. Lord, let your mercy speak for my soul this day in the name of Jesus. Forgive me, O God. Wash me with your precious blood. Let your mercy, O God, override your judgment in my life. And Lord, give me grace, O God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, King of Glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Finally, let us also pray at this point and ask God to give you the grace to obey his commandment. The grace to submit totally to the word of God, even as Jesus did. Let us pray in the name of Jesus. Mighty God, King of glory, my Lord and my God, Lord, I pray that you will grant me the grace to absolutely submit to your word. The grace to absolutely, O oh God, obey you in all things, whether it makes sense or whether it does not make sense. King of glory, Lord of Lord, the grace for absolute obedience, O oh God, Lord, grant unto me, I pray, in the name of Jesus. And say my prayer for everyone under the sound of my voice. And for every member of this church, O oh God, King of glory, and for our respective families, O oh God, Lord, give us the grace of absolute obedience to your commandment. For in this is the law of the Father. Lord, do this for us, O oh God. And let your name alone be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So we're going to give opportunity for contribution. And questions. And, um, but today, please could you help me to pass the mics for those who want to say something. So meanwhile, while we wait for a contribution, I know because of our time, I didn't finish all of it, but let me just go to conclusion and give us the conclusion. 
So the conclusion says, loving the Father is keeping his commandments. Not commandment, commandments. The love for the Father is made perfect in us through the keeping of his commandments. The love of the Father is made perfect in us through the keeping of his commandments. First John chapter 2 verse 5. First John chapter 2 verse 5. And it says, But whoever keeps his sorry, but whoever keeps his word, that is the word of God, truly love the love, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him, and by this we know that we love him. Bless us. Right. Contributions, questions at this point.